Hello, welcome back. Um, I'm now joined and excited to welcome the managing partner of Wads Inc, Stephen Waddington, who is currently live from a barge on the Thames. Literally. So that's like remote work into its ultimate. Um, just to give you a bit of background around Stephen, he's a professional advisor to creative agencies and comms team. He's also a leading author and blogger on marketing, media and PR. And we'll be talking with us today to ask the age-old question, why is PR so bad at its, at its own PR? So as we take a light-hearted look at the endemic PR industry issues and answer a few of his own. So just before I hand over to Stephen, don't forget, use the emojis to show your appreciation and reactions to the session. Uh, you've got the chat on the right-hand side, so add your comments in there. But any questions, pop them in the Q&A at the right-hand side at the top tab. You can also turn on automatic subtitles by clicking the CC button below. So I'll hand over to you now, Stephen. Uh, best of luck, and I'll catch up with you after with Q&A. Thanks, Elliot. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. It's good to good to be here. Uh, I want to thank Elliot and the resource team for putting on another great Comms Hero event and for inviting me back to speak um, today. So as you know, my name's Stephen Waddington. Bad luck if you're expecting Sarah Waddington today. Um, she's uh, otherwise engaged. Um, I've worked in public relations for the last 25 years, mainly in agencies. Uh, and as Elliot said, I've, I've built, bought and sold agencies. I've written books, notably, uh, head over to Amazon and check these out, Exploring PR and Management Communication. Uh, that was published at the start of uh, last year with Dr. Ralph Tench, sorry, the start of this year, uh, 2021, uh, and Brand Anarchy and Brand Vandals with, with Steve Earle. I've also taken an active role uh, in our industry associations um, over my career, including a stint as president of the CIPR. Um, so I'm a product of COVID-19. I started a professional advisory firm called Wards Inc. Uh, we consult and re provide research services to agencies and communication teams. And as Elliot said, I'm also a visiting professor at Newcastle uh, University. Now, one of the things I did during uh, the lockdown was start an online community of practice. Um, and it, it's been a thoughtful and occasionally reverent place to kick around ideas about our profession. There's around 2,000 people who contribute to discussions week in, week out. And we one thing we produce a monthly uh, newsletter, you might have seen it, full of industry goodness of, of of pulling out some of the, the hot issues of, of each week. Uh, so there's topics that come up time and time again in, in the community and, and kindly the Comms Hero team have allowed me some time to, to share some of those um, with you today. Um, so I've got 15 topics I want to get through uh, covering a broad area of issues in our profession over the next 20 minutes or so. So strap in and let's go. Um, so I'm going to hit these off one by one, um, be quite quick, uh, and, um, and and give you my perspective. So if you get three people together uh, in public relations um, for a chat at any point, we used to do it down the pub, now we do it over Zoom, uh, or hopefully we're getting back to the pub. Um, one question they will ask within five or ten minutes is, um, firstly, why is... PR week by monthly. I'll come on to that. Second is, will the PRCA and the CIPR ever merge? Why do we have two industry associations in our industry? Um, short answer to this is no, it won't happen in my lifetime. The longer answer, uh, that requires a, a brief history lesson. So the PRCA started um, by a group, actually, of CIPR members. It came out of the CIPR in 1969. Uh, a group of members who wanted to address the specific needs of agency founders got together. In the in the intervening years, um, it's broadened its its remit. Uh, so we're now in the position 50 years on, where we have two organisations representing our industry, an industry that you know contributes 16 billion pounds to the economy and employs a workforce of around 100 100,000 people. Um, you know, significant data points, data points from the. 2020 PRCA centers. You can go and check that out for yourself. Um, my view is, and this is my personal view, that a single organization will benefit from scale standards, including crucially, I think, a single code of conduct, which our industry needs, and a voice to government and business. Um, it won't happen 
because uh, the issue quickly becomes dismissed in CIPR communities. I think possibly because of the deeply entrenched views um, from, from that original split. Now, it's good to see the two organizations working together increasingly assertive, assertively to drive up standards in, in our uh, industry. Uh, it would be good to see much, much closer cooperation, crucially around things such as representation and a code of conduct and many of the issues I'm going to talk about um, today. So, first one. Second point, why is the public relations industry not representative of the organisations of the public uh, or the public that it serves? Um, I'm not sure what a middle class white man can tell you about um, diversity, um, but undoubtedly our industry is white, it's middle class and it's posh. We overrepresent for people, we over index for people who went to, to public school. Of course, I'm generalizing to make a point, um, but CIPR data and PRCA data shows an industry that simply isn't representative of, of society. Uh, and seeing as we want to represent the public, we absolutely should be. Uh, ethnicity, gender, socioeconomic diversity are all issues. Um, there's an interesting uh, data point today. None of the top UK PR agencies participated in the recent PR week uh, pay gap study. There's a whole load of reasons for that, but you know it's an interesting signpost of the issue. Um, the Taylor Bennett Foundation, Blueprint, and mine and Sarah Waddington's community interest group, Socially Omel, Mobile, are all aiming to make very specific interventions. Uh, but this issue, in my mind, needs to be addressed downstream. Um, I think we need to solve this by creating a much larger pipeline of practitioners, by creating greater awareness for the for the comms profession um, in schools. Next point, um, why is public relations so often conflated with, with media relations? This requires another history lesson. Um, so media relations is but one part of, of what public relations um, does when practice as a management discipline. Um, Ever since Ivy Lee sent the first press release in, oh, I've actually got the date, on the 28th of October, 1906, public relations has been associated with media relations. Um, Ivy Lee released a statement to the press on behalf of the Pennsylvania Railroad uh, in New York about a train wreck that tragically killed 50 people. He deemed this to be effective means of communicating quickly to a large number of media outlets. In fact, the New York Times printed the, the press release in full. Um, since then, publicists and agencies have continued to focus solely on, on media and exaggerate this issue of public relations being media relations. And maintaining relationships with the media is no doubt an important area of practice but it's one only one area of practice let's think about some others and media is a channel it sits along page shared owned uh, and practice includes research planning content measurement um, in addition to all the media channels that i've mentioned so to conflate media relations with public relations does us no favors whatsoever in my view sorry my slides are um, my slides are um, out of sync here Next point, why is the public, why is the press release the primary um, form of communication um, and content for, for public relations? And this relates to the previous point about earned media. Earned media is the primary, is identified as the primary form of public relations. Ergo, the press release is the primary form of, of content, whether that's correct or not. So if journalists are your primary stakeholder, then yes, the press release as the primary form of content makes absolute sense. And thousands of these documents are sprayed out every single day on news wires and websites. And that's the issue. Press releases are well understood in organizations and used as a general purpose form of communication. They act as a corporate, a common corporate language. And in this sense, they're useful because everyone understands them. They can also, they can be carved up for different channels. Um, but please understand the press release isn't the answer to every communication uh, question. It's just only one answer. And it has become accepted as a general purpose tool. There's an often, there's a, a, a common meme in public relations communities about the death of the press release. It's been written, that story has been written many, many times. The press release isn't going anywhere. Um, it's more popular than, than ever. 
more used than ever. And um, my fifth point, so why is chartered status, the status, uh, the accreditation provided by the CIPR, why is that in public relations um, not a standard and why is it not better respected? Um, there's a number of reasons for this. So chartered status in any other profession or in most other professions it re is, realize, is, is recognized as a, a measure of, of excellence. And it's something that if you are an engineer, you absolutely uh, look to, to achieve through your professional practice. Um, in public relations, a computer and a connection to the internet is the only real barrier to entry. I'm gonna come back to that point several times. Uh, today. And it's possible to earn £150,000 uh, or more uh, without any form of accreditation or professional qualification. Um, I want to consider some numbers. So uh, the PRTA census reports that number that there's 100,000 people working in public relations and related roles. Uh, the CIPR and PRCA have between them, um, the CIPR 10,000 members thereabouts, the PRCA 35 members, 1,000 members thereabouts through through different organizations that individually uh, um, um, adhere to each organization's code of conduct. And if we look at CPD, so that's commitment to formal learning, only two and a half thousand practitioners participate in, in, in continu continuous learning via the, the CIPR. And there's around 400 chartered practitioners. That number's climbing, but it's climbing slowly and there's the issue the data tells the story professional accreditation in our industry without a barrier to entry is always going to be a long long game it also relates to this point why does everyone in an organization think they can do public relations this is a tweet you might have seen it over the weekend uh, and i promised that i i i, I I saw this tweet and I nested it and retweeted it and said, this tweet will appear in every communication deck for the next 12 months or so. And, and this is the first time I've put it in a deck of mine. Um, um, this uh, was Nadine Norris, the uh, cabinet minister who tweeted at the weekend uh, that there wasn't a, uh, a fuel shortage uh, in the UK and then screened it. There is no fuel shortage. An example uh, of a behavioral scientist uh, science technique or framing, uh, bringing to everyone's consciousness that there might be a fuel uh, a fuel shortage uh, and and flagging that as a, a red flag. Um, this is this is the chart question, but from the other end of the telescope. We've already discussed there's no barriers to entry in public relations, and then every anyone with a rudimentary understanding of practice can and a rudimentary understanding can practice. Um, much of our work is based on the written word. And as any student of English literature will tell you, uh, it's both situational and it's subjective. And the only certainty uh, is anyone in a, everyone in an organization, anyone in an organization will have a point of view because we all think we can do it. Everyone thinks we can do it. But as we've seen during the COVID-19 pandemic, I've written lots about this, Professional communications, communications practiced as a management discipline has supported through crisis, innovation, change, productivity and life itself. So there's a difference between communications and communications applied as a management discipline. Uh, and there you go, Nadine Norris. Um, Doris showed it up uh, for herself. Um, point seven, we're about halfway through. Um, why are public relations degrees so poorly regarded by practice? Um, public relations courses in the UK uh, are in decline, although uh, at bachelor level, although at, at postgraduate level are, are increasing. Something odd is going on uh, in the market. Um, centres of excellence like Bournemouth have, have discontinued public relations. Um, you know, organisations like uh, Leeds Beckett are, are, are thriving uh, my own uh, organization Newcastle uh, where we I, I teach on a, a master's in public relations is 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 thriving I this point relates to the wholly unrealistic expectation that um, that practice has that graduates should be oven ready and immediately on entering the workforce be able to undertake a stakeholder audit write a blog pitch media um, 
And that's a situation that is completely unique to public relations and possibly marketing. Um, entry level roles demand work experience. That in itself is a nonsense. In any other professional discipline, there's a period of conversion between formal learning and practice. Think about accountancy, think about the law. Um, I would say to anyone that is studying public relations, uh, either at, at an undergrad or postgrad level, hang in there because attitudes are changing. Uh, and that's because of, of COVID and the shortage we have in the market of talent at the moment. Entry level roles at the moment command a salary of 25,000 and thereabouts. Uh, and it's possible to make 35,000 to 50,000 in, in three to five years. Go and check out the data yourself in, in salary benchmarking. Um, um, and certainly, you know, it's an industry that has been good to to me. Um, a re related point, if you like, why does public relations, why doesn't public relations realize uh, the value that it deserves? This relates back to the point I made about media. So I started my career in public relations, cutting and pasting press clippings, as many people in agencies do. We compile press books for clients at the end of each month. And 25 years later, much of the workflow of public relations is still focused on, on media, um, whether that be the press clipping or uh, other forms of, of, of social or own media. We measure impressions, we measure reach, we measure opportunities, and we use these as the means to demonstrate the results of our labor. These are all, let me tell you now, poor proxies for business outcomes. That's where we should be focused. We should be focused on using robust planning tools such as the AMEC Integrated Evaluation Framework or the Government Communication Service OASIS model to align and measure the activity um, that we do against organizational objectives. It's the surest way to ensuring public relations activity receives its fair share of budget uh, and practitioners are rewarded accordingly. Uh, uh, this, this, this in in this question in in PR and communication uh, communities is like the CIPR PRCA PR Week uh, question. It, it's a question we bang our head against the wall with uh, time and time again. What's the purpose and value of the CLA and the NLA? This is probably the most contentious subject in my deck. Um, the Copyright Licensing Association, the CLA, the Newspaper Licensing Association, the LLA, exists to protect the rights of copyright holders. That's a reasonable enough purpose. If I generate content, I expect a fair value exchange with my audience. That may be financial, might be marketing, or it might be some form of benefit in kind. Now, the CLA and the NLA pursue licenses from agencies and organizations that share content created by publishers, their members. Public relations practitioners react badly to this for two reasons. Firstly, the industry, we as practitioners, support the media and the creation of content in the first place and reject that, that this additional cost as an unfair value exchange. And secondly, and I think this is, this is the number of the issue, the CLA and the NLA use aggressive sales techniques leading to what has become an incredibly fractious relationship. <laughs> Floating staff down the Thames is a lazy, often abused idea, but it's guaranteed to get you a picture story in any national media. That picture of the boat of the, the barge going under Tower Bridge will get you on uh, the first six pages of any of the tabloid or national media. Whether that's going to contribute to your reputation or sales for your organization is another thing entirely. Um, and it's with no sense uh, of, of irony whatsoever, and this has already been spotted, that I'm speaking to you uh, from a barge on the River Thames, not too far from Tower Bridge as it happens. Um, it's mine and Sarah's home and office in London where we're here, and uh, it's available to anyone uh, within the Comms Hero community to hire uh, if you're interested, and we'll do you a very good rate. Um, <laughs> question 11. Uh, why has ASAP become an acceptable deadline in public relations? This is a nonsense. It's an issue that's particularly cute in the agency client relationship. We work in PR, not ER. We may, yes, operate in a 24 seven environment, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't plan a, a, a pro properly. There's always gonna be work that needs to be delivered at short notice, but that shouldn't be the norm. Um, this is an issue that's become particularly acute during 
lockdown and COVID-19, messaging applications such as Slack should be a tool and not a management means within themselves. And even during a crisis, work needs to be planned and scheduled um, properly. I, I, I posted a, a, a link within uh, the, the community I run. Uh, when I was originally um, planning this deck uh, and asked for suggestions of topics uh, that we might talk about. And seriously, this did come up. Uh, why is PR Week by monthly? And um, PR Week is a story of the current media environment, much like any other publication. It used to be weekly, but it went multi-channel in November 1998. I checked that date. Uh, with the launch of an email newsletter and a website. The print edition went monthly, and I checked this date, 2013, and then it went bi-monthly in 2016. The original moniker, though, has stuck because a brand it, as a brand it works, to be fair. Um, other industry media are, of course, available, including Provoke, PR Moment, and, um, of course, blogs such as my own. Question... 13. Why are there so many public relations agencies in the UK? Now, this is an area uh, that I've studied m myself uh, uh, with the team at Wadsing. Um, we've already explored the fact that anyone can start a public practice, public relations. Ergo, anyone can start a public relations agency. The startup costs are low. You basically need to cover your salary costs until you win a client. There are, in fact, 4,000 public relations agencies in the UK. Uh, Starting an agency is really easy. Growing it into a large business is, is more challenging. So most agent most agencies, in fact, 3,855, I checked that number, uh, employ less than five people. Um, the agency market is a broad church that encompasses, as we've learned, publicity, internal comms, crisis, and strategic management communication. Um, an agency a week, and this is where I've, I've stood in the market particularly, an agency a week was launched during uh, COVID-19. Um, um, Wadding published a report on, on exactly this topic and explored what was driving this. Um, and we concluded that it was uh, entrepreneurs finding a, a very clear proposition and a market opportunity um, um, amongst the, the, the displacement and, and chaos of uh, in the market of the pandemic. Um, we're getting close to the end now. I've got two more uh, two more points for you. Um, why is procurement such a lousy way to buy public relations services? Um, interestingly, where this question was raised actually by uh, in-house people within uh, my community and not not agencies, uh, not people working in agencies. So. Procurement is a best practice approach to purchasing bulk products such as baked beans and maybe toilet rolls, but it's a lousy basis for buying professional services aimed at building relationships. It's optimized for, my, for financial management, sure, excuse me. Uh, it's suboptimal for, for public relations. Um, and you know, agencies mangle their services into numerous spreadsheets that they submit through portals um, that are at least in the first instance, not by robots. Um, again, not a sensible way to, to, to buy services aimed at um, building uh, strategic relationships. Purchasers end up locked into to, to rosters of supplies. In my mind, it, it supports and helps nobody. Uh, my last point, is the public relations industry part of the fake news uh, problem? Lots of discussion in our industry about this topic at the moment, about the woe, about the, the issues caused around uh, with fake news, particularly during the, the, the pandemic uh, with, with anti-vax and, and so forth. And we're seeing it, um, seeing it also uh, around uh, climate with uh, COP26 coming up. I've slipped this in at the end because I've just read a thought-provoking book that I want to recommend to you um, called Public Relations Capitalism. Uh, it was written by a woman called Anne Cronin. Anne's a scholar at Lancaster University who argues, takes a really interesting uh, perspective. She argues that public relations corrupts the public sphere. Uh, she says it enables corporations to insert messages into the public uh, conversation, and that in itself contributes to a breakdown in the democratic process um you don't have to go far actually to find uh agreement with that position within our community within the public relations community so the chair of the prca's climate uh, misinformation strategy uh group uh and the ceo of uh don't cry wolf 
uh, John White, John Brown, sorry, John, has cited BP's campaign in 2004, you might remember it, to promote individual carbon footprints as an example of this issue. So the promotion of carbon footprints uh, displaced responsibility for carbon emissions from industry to consumer. Uh, and that the impact of that campaign we're still dealing with uh, more than two decades on. Um, a, 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 any response to, to the carbon crisis and climate change requires a system level response uh, from, from industry. And yes, why well, it's laudable enough for me to go vegan and recycle, uh, recycle as an individual, um, it isn't going to achieve the scale of, of response that, that we need. I'd also, if you're interested in this issue, I'd recommend Bill Gates' book on it, How Do We Solve Climate Crisis? The climate crisis because he's done an awful lot of thinking around the issue of communication um so the subtitle of this session was why is the public relations industry so badly at managing its own image uh, and its own reputation i think the answer lies amongst the topics we've discussed today we're a young growing industry we're we're adolescent even the industry's around 100 years old we have many issues to address uh, as we grow up uh, and become older um, I once asked my mentor and colleague, Dr. John White, Dr. John White, what stops him becoming grumpy and fed up with our industry's seemingly lack of progress on these issues. John's a, um, a Henley Business School researcher who contributed to the agenda setting research and book, Excellence in Public Relations and Communications Management, as any scholar of public relations will know, was um, the research led by James Grunig in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, we constantly, we seemingly constantly reinvent ourselves in a bid to professionalize and realize our value as a management discipline. Um, and John's response was interesting. He said, our role is to keep asking questions and inspiring the next generation to put for, push forward standards and practice. And that's what I've aimed to do today. And I hope I've achieved that goal. Um, I think we've now got some time, a uh, quarter of an hour or so, to, to revisit any of the topics I've, I've discussed today. I'd also be happy to, to consider any new ones that you might want to, to ask. Uh, and um, Elliot, if you want to jump back in. Yeah, brilliant. Thank, yeah. Thanks for that, Stephen. I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of everyone here. That was, that was really interesting and a very wide coverage of PR in general and, and the topic. Uh, we do have a couple of questions, actually, that have, that have just fired through. Um, so, Helen Reynolds, have you got any more cool reading recommendations for the bookworms among us? Um, do you know what? I'm going to, uh, I, I don't read a lot. I should read more. Um, but um, I, during lockdown, I discovered two things. I discovered an Audible that I'd never really used before. Um, uh, and it's just a great way of listening to books. Uh, uh you know and if you if you're out and about and and you know walking the dog or whatnot so i i, I i'm on the plan where you get one a month and i tend that tends to do me so stuff I've, i'm just looking at it now stuff i've looked at recently or listened to news recently news by ellen rusbridger the the uh former editor of the guardian he he takes a look at um at um you know how we've got to where we've got with the news industry and what the future might look like um two books by malcolm gladwell uh that actually sarah recommended to me the first one is outliers we have this notion that that um um you know exceptional people or exceptional performance um relies on on um you know excellence and actually no uh anyone that's exceptional tends to have had um some experience that has got them to their position it, it's been a heavily influenced to to our work with socially mobile talking to strangers by michael gladwell is an interesting really interesting book uh gladwell tends to pe find subjects and then uh, almost dive into them a, a, a you know a, a doctoral level uh, analysis so talking to strangers uh, examines why we don't uh, you know we we we, we uh, don't basically believe um, question bullshit and lies um, and and you know it has to be fairly extreme before we will actually uh, call out uh, something uh, two more good to great 
uh, by Jim Collins, a study that was done at the end of the 90s on, on yeah, organizations and what makes them good, and uh, Poles Apart, actually a brilliant book by Ali Gold, Goldsworthy, just been published. Uh, Poles Apart looks at polarization in the media uh, and why we've got to where we have uh, and, and what, what you know, that she proposes what might uh, bring us back together uh, as disparate communities. So, yeah, hopefully there's some good stuff there long list there but yeah a lot of people in the chat actually saying audible is the go-to now and, and trace has even said uh love gladwell his podcast is also insightful yeah um, we've got a, another interesting question actually uh from nafisa so as an observer it feels like many of us are trying to create their own online comms communities so beyond the cipr and prca uh often it's the same people just in the different communities what are your thoughts on it and are there any helpful ones for pr pros do they start to create cliques? So I would say um, uh, a clique will only exist if it's if a community is closed. Um, I would say one of the wonderful things about the internet, the internet's a wonderful thing. Going back to a book, wonderful a book that was written at the end of the nineties called the Clue Train Manifesto. Uh, the Clue Train Manifesto said, um, um, you know, uh, people are markets. Uh, people will come together if they're provided a platform like the internet to find each other uh, and work together. And I think what's happened is many of the, these communities have, have become established to solve issues and, and problems, often single issues, single problems, and people have coalesced around a, 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 an, a, an idea or an issue. Um, the community I described that much of the genesis of this, this uh uh, conversation today has come from, you know, was founded out during the lockdown as a means for people at home to support each other. And, you know, we did a, uh, an event once a month and, and that f tended to be really useful. You know, if, pe if people want to come together, uh, f f find an issue that they want to coalesce the ground and come together to try and fix stuff, then I think that's only can only be a good thing. Well. And I've got another question actually for you, Stephen. So obviously there's quite a lot of roles coming through in PR, comms, marketing, where often enough it's just not made up of multiple people in a team. It, it's usually one person now in, in most organisations. Is there or should there be a combined certification? Um, obviously we've got the CIPR, CIM, PRCA and so on. But is there anything that's sort of overriding that covers all them nuances or is it too broad to, to specify a certification for it? I, I, so it, this is this almost relates to the community question because because you know who is it to start a community who is it to provide certification around uh, an issue um you know it tends to be if the market isn't served by and then let's forget that sorry let's not forget we're starting from a position where there is a requirement for absolutely no accreditation in our industry you can earn 150,000 a year uh, and more without any level of formal qualification in, in public relations, you know, go and have a look at the jobs on LinkedIn and Glassdoor at the moment that are being advertised. Um, whether that's good or not, we can debate. And I hope I've shown that through this talk that I firmly believe, you know, there is a need for for, for formal learning and, and accreditation in our industry. Uh, otherwise, you get daft tweets from from government ministers and everyone thinks they can do it. Um, the The issue is though if a market if in a market uh, a need isn't being met um, innovation will drive if markets operating well in, innovation will new will drive uh, alternative provision and i think this is what you've seen uh, around our industry and especially at the moment there's lots of different uh, organizations uh, working on different means and interventions of providing uh, professional development uh, and learning um you know, to, to address some of the needs uh, that we see in our industry. You know, we read uh, week in, week out in any survey you seemingly want to, to pick up about the need for strategic um, um, skills within our industry. But then, you know, you look at um, you look at uh, providers providing education and, you know, so often the courses are, are focused on core tactics and there's clearly a mismatch there. So, yeah, alternative providers are providing uh, mean uh, different interventions you know google's coming into the market linkedin's coming to the market you know uh, so on and so forth if those are if those meet a need then you know that's good brilliant and um, we've, we've got a comment in the chat from rachel miller so 
Uh, crew train says people in network markets have figured out that they get far better information and support from one another rather than from vendors, which is really interesting given the whole CIPR, PRCA, and all the other accreditations and certifications you can do that these communities that have built up actually provide just the amount, the same amount of value as as some certifications, which is interesting. Yeah, I, that, so so Rachel and I have been blogging in this uh, industry for uh, ten or fifteen years. We and you know we both were very early into it and recognised. Um, I think recognised um, the opportunity for blogging as a means to build our own networks and communities around ourselves and our own professional practice to the point that you know um, Rachel has all things IT and a consulting business and you know I've increasingly developed Wads Inc around it and you can see yeah the, you know those have become their media entities but then yeah they, those communities have become businesses but also much much more um, um, you know I'll take you back 10 years an example uh, an example um, that involved both both Rachel and I within the CIPR. The CIPR created a social media panel um, purely to look at uh, the interventions needed to provide practitioners within with the tools they required to develop skills in, in social media. Um, and um, that panel did some brilliant work. We wrote white papers and such like. Um, uh, uh, and we ended up publishing two books uh, with Wiley, uh, share this and share this too. Rachel contributed to both, um, and and you know that's an example of what a network can do. And yes, that was under the auspices of, of the CIPR, and you know CIPR and the PRCA do some great work. But there's a whole lot as we've seen. You know, without too much thought, I've come up with 15 issues in our industry that need fixing. Um, that anyone could equally, you know, could set up a, an intervention to to deal with them. And, and many people are. Um, that's a, a sorry, a long rambly answer to to a point well made by uh, by Rachel Miller. Thanks for that, Rachel. Um, I've got a copy of Clutro Manifesto. I've got one of the two, uh, the only two copies signed by all four authors, uh, locked away actually, um, in very firmly away. But uh, yeah, bought to it, bought for me by um, by Sarah Waddington, as it happens. Um, well, speaking of Sarah. Um, we wanted to give a shout out to Mrs. Wads and Socially Mobile. So I don't know if you want to give your own uh, shout out as well, Stephen, but Comzo wanted to say a massive congrats on her CBE. Yeah, so, so you know, uh, there aren't many people in the in the PR industry have got CBEs. Uh, and uh, I think it speaks to, you know, uh, the, the work Sarah's done uh, quietly for, for, you know, 10, 15 years or more. Um, uh, helping different organisations regionally in the northeast, but then um, um, uh, uh, initiatives and projects that she's led and, and driven, such as Future Proof, her own community that's published, uh, I think five or six books now. Um, um, you know, and and she continues to be a fierce advocate of promoting um, public relations as a as a management. Uh, management discipline uh, and you know through both both our work her big uh, focus at the moment is um, the alignment of public relations with business and and influencing the business uh, the business community uh, along with with socially mobile socially mobile aiming to provide a specific intervention to help people make that jump from a tactical um, tactical role up to to a professional management role um, over a 10-week exec education course. Incredible achievement. So, uh, yeah, I think that that's a wrap for, good? for that. Brilliant. So thank you for thank you for your time, Stephen. Emojis in the chat um, and also comments in the chat for Stephen. So thank you for your time. Um, just before we head off onto the next break, don't forget to jump on the tables, connect with other comms zero types. You don't know what conversation you're going to have, which what makes it part of the experience. Um, we've still got our competition running, so you can win a notepad, Sharpies. We've got pets at home vouchers. Um, don't forget to use the hashtag comms hero when posting on social media to enter. Um, again, as uh, Stephen pointed out, the importance of CIPR and certifications. Each session is worth five points, so don't forget to log them. And we've got over 200 points available in total, and all will be available to rewatch over the next 12 months. Um, so before we head into the next session, which starts at 4.15, 
Uh, we'll be hearing from Rachel Tolhurst speaking on Let's Talk About Commons Measurement. So thank you, for Stephen, and thank you for everyone for joining. Uh, yeah, and a big shout out to you, uh, to the Comms Hero team and, you know, uh, everything that, that you do uh, and have done to build this community because, you know, it's, it's really important that we have communities like this that celebrate the work, um, celebrate the work of, of our working practitioners. Brilliant. No, thanks for that, Stephen. Great to have you on and uh, looking forward to the week ahead. Thanks, guys. Take care.